What is the instantaneous speed? Well, speed is not sign sensitive. Suppose that the velocity here, just I call that V1, suppose that was plus 30 meters per second. I just grabbed this number out of the blue. And suppose here somewhere it was, I call that V2, suppose that was minus 100 meters per second. This is negative and this is positive. Then we would have to say in physics, whether you like it or not, it's not very pleasing, but you would have to say that this velocity is lower than that one, because minus 100 is lower than plus 30. But the speed, of course, is higher here, because the speed is the magnitude of the velocity and is not sign sensitive. So this has the highest speed of 100 meters per second, and this has a lower speed, but this has the lowest velocity. It's just an algebraic game, but very important when you make your calculations. I have always wondered what the average speed or the average velocity is of a bullet. Now I want you to realize I'm not a fan of guns at all, but it always intrigued me. How can I measure the average speed of a bullet? And I've discussed it with some people here, and we came up with an easy way to do that. We have a wire which goes into the blackboard, wire one, and we have another wire that goes into the blackboard, wire two, and the separation is d meters. We have to measure that. The setup is here. So this is wire number one, and this is wire number two. So you will see the coming in like this, so I'll make this a one, and I'll make this a two. That's the way it's set up. And we fire a bullet, which breaks this wire. At that moment, the timer starts, and then it breaks this wire, and that's when the timer stops. Now, I told you, a measurement is meaningless without knowledge of the uncertainty in your measurement. So there are two uncertainties involved, the distance and the timing uncertainty. This distance I will measure for you, d. I have here a large ruler. Here is one wire, here's the other wire. I cannot do that any better, really, than maybe even half a centimeter, because the situation is not all that stable. I don't know what happens when the bullet will hit the wire. So I would say it is 148 and a half centimeters, but I cannot guarantee it to better than half a centimeter. 148 and a half plus or minus 0.5 centimeters. I want you to appreciate that this is a very small percentage error. This is only five parts out of 1,500. That is one out of 300, so that is only a one-third percent error. That's very small. That's what we call the relative error. Then I ask myself the question, I want to measure the accuracy of the speed of the bullet to about two percent. That was my goal. How accurate should I do the timing? Well, I had to make an estimate very roughly how fast the speed of the bullet is. And I would think it is probably lower than the speed of sound. The speed of sound is 340 meters per second. I don't know whether it's 200 or 300, but it's got to be somewhere in that ballpark of the kind of bullets that we have, 200 or 300 meters per second. Let us assume that the speed is 300 meters per second. Just a wild guess. Then it would take five milliseconds for this bullet to cross from here to here. And if I want to make a measurement to two percent accuracy, I have to know this timing to about one-tenth of a millisecond, because one-tenth of a millisecond is about two percent of five. So that sets the accuracy that I need to make the time measurements. And so we do have a timer. It is about accurate to about a tenth of a millisecond. And so now I can measure that time. So I'm going to have here some time that we measure, plus or minus 0.1, and we'll do the whole thing in milliseconds. 
but our final answer will be in meters per second. All right. I always have to think hard when I do this, because when we deal with bullets, that is no kid stuff. And as I said, I have really no experience firing guns. This is the bolt. There we go. Here's the bolt. There we go. It's in place. Before I do that, I want to check, check the circuit. I want to make sure that the electronic circuit is properly working. You see the timing here, right? So I do a small test just to see whether the circuit is working. Yeah. Should be working. So here comes the bullet. You're ready, I'm ready. Three, two, one, zero. What do we see? 5.8 milliseconds. 5.8, is that what you see? Yeah. 5.8 milliseconds. 5.8 plus or minus 0.1. So out comes the average Call it speed or call it velocity, it's the same thing in this case. 148.5, 5.8, and I have to convert it to meters per second. That brings it at 256, plus or minus. Now you come in here with your plus or minuses. This is a one-third percent error. It's negligible to this one. One out of 58 is about 1.7 percent. So this is the only one we have to worry about. So the uncertainty in there is about 1.7 percent. It's less than two, that's what I wanted. And that gives me an error of about four meters per second. And so this is the result. And you see, it's only meaningful because we have a good idea about the uncertainties in the measurement. Just as we introduced average, average velocity, now I'm going to introduce average acceleration. Notice that the velocity changes here throughout time. And that brings me to the next part, the logical part, namely that we're going to introduce an average acceleration. And with a little bit of imagination, you can probably guess what that looks like. The average acceleration between time t1 and time t2 would then be the velocity at time t2 minus the velocity at time t1 divided by t2 minus t1, and the dimension is length per second per time squared, so it's meters per second squared. This is then for a one-dimensional situation. This number can be larger than zero, it can be equal to zero, and it can be smaller than zero. In our case, t1 to t2, here, notice the velocity is zero as a start, and it begins to increase because this angle of alpha increases. It's the angle that matters. The angle increases, so in our case, from t1 to t2, the average acceleration is larger than zero. Look at the angle. However, if you take the average acceleration between t1 and t5, that is smaller than zero. Because here, the velocity is zero. But here, the velocity is negative. So if you substitute that in there, you get an average acceleration which is smaller than zero. So the signs in the velocity and the signs in average acceleration depend crucially on how I have defined my increasing value of x, not where I choose my zero point. If I reverse the direction of increasing x, then all my signs will change. So you can also write down then that average acceleration, if you like that, is delta v divided by delta t, but you must be careful because the delta v is sign sensitive. You must obey your sign